الحمد لله نحمد سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جزيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين We are still tracing the topic of the people in the Quran or people in the Quran and we are following the story of the children of Israel as it comes in the Quran from the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah and today we are going to talk about two sections of that story one section is about the children of Israel in the diaspora and in the diaspora they stayed for about 40 years so they were literally living in the open desert and this was a punishment for them for not willing for not being willing or obedient when Musa commanded them and told them that Allah wants you to enter into Jerusalem and they refused citing the power of the people of Jerusalem and they, they claimed that they cannot get in and you know the story we spoke about it before so they were sent into the diaspora in the diaspora what do you need the most you need food and water we need food and water because this is how we survive in the desert as far as food we went over that section that part of the section that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for them not only any food or food that they cultivate ready-made food coming from heaven right so the response was وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَىٰ لَنْ نَصْبِرَ عَلَىٰ طَعَامٍ وَاحِدٍ And as you recall or remember, you told Moses that we cannot stand having one type of food all the time. It's boring. Even though it is honey, even though it is quails, cooked quails, and ready to drink honey. But that, they said to Musa, we cannot bear with this for a long time. What were they looking for? فَادْعُ لَنَا رَبَّكَ يُخْرِجْ لَنَا مِمَّا تُنْبِتُ الْأَرْضِ مِنْ بَقْلِهَا وَقِثَّائِهَا وَعَدَسِهَا وَفُومِهَا وَعَدَسِهَا وَبَصَلِهَا Let Allah bring for us from the earth whatever produces it has. Cucumber, onion, garlic, something herish, يعني شيء, something that they can use for appetizers and something that has taste and flavor and strong flavor uh, it's self-spiced it doesn't need spices with it and uh, we also need lentil and onion so Moses questioned the request would you substitute what is best for what is worst it is much less quality food. Leave it for the Egyptians. Let's enjoy what we have. No, they insisted. Get down to a country where they cultivate. Let us move on. Where do they go? They go to Egypt. And there, وَضُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الذِّلَّةُ وَالْمَسْكَنَةُ Amazing, Yusuf, when he invited his father and his family, he told them, "Udhulu Misra in Allahu Aminin." Right? But the children of Israel who disobeyed Moses, they went into Egypt, and what was awaiting for them? It is humiliation, 
insult, inferior life, torment at the hands of Pharaoh and his people. ضربت عليهم الذلة والمسكنة. They were so much tormented and exploited that they could not bear it. They would run back to the desert with Moses. Moses, the one who they never disobeyed, they never obeyed. Now he tells them, "We're going through the Red Sea, and they are willing to go with him." You see how much torment they lived through in Egypt. اهبطوا مصرا فإن لكم ما سألتم وضربت عليهم الذلة والمسكنة وباءوا بغضب من الله The wrath of Allah came upon them ذلك بأنهم كانوا يكفرون بآيات الله ويقتلون النبيين بغير الحق This is because of their rejection of prophets denial of messages that kept coming to them and as we mentioned before Almost 24,000 prophets in one community, generation after generation after generation. Community from one place to another place. They still get their prophets as if they are secure to get the message. So they took these prophets and these messages for granted. They started denying bulk rate prophets and killing more than one prophet at the same time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his wrath upon them. There is a point for us here. Rejecting prophet does not require that you kill a prophet so that you show that you reject a prophet. You could reject a prophet without killing a prophet. So they have committed the two crimes, denying the prophets and rejecting the prophets, denying the ayat of Allah and rejecting and uh, killing the prophets. Salawatullah alayhim. For us Muslims, the lesson is, are we accepting the Prophet? I'm raising a question, I'm not comparing. But comparison is due because Allah doesn't tell us the stories of other people just to entertain us, but to give us the lessons. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةً So we need to get the lesson. We are not saying that story to entertain ourselves or to feel good about ourselves. No, we have to feel the warning embedded in the story. You don't want to be humiliated. You don't want to be underprivileged under any circumstances. You don't want Allah to send his wrath upon you as a community. So at least you don't do what the children of Israel have done because they did it and they got the punishment. Now, in our case, do we recognize the punishment we're having? Do we notice the punishment our Ummah is going through? Does this mean that we have done something similar? Or could it mean that Allah will favor us no matter what? No. Allah doesn't favor a community over a community. And He makes it very clear. لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيِّ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ It is not up to your wishful thinking, nor is it up to the wishful thinking of the people of the book. They also used to say, نَحْنُ أَبْنَاءُ اللَّهِ وَأَحِبَّاؤُ We are the most favored chosen children of God, and we are His beloved. Means what? We are His beloved children. Do fathers kill their own children? Not in the norm, right? So that was their claim. What is our claim? What, are, what is the claim that Muslims are using today? The claim they are using is whoever says La ilaha illallah will enter paradise. It's a hadith, and the hadith is in Bukhari. The hadith is authentic, but we misread it. Because the word say in the Arabic language does not mean uttering with the tongue alone. Because the tongue should never speak what is not in the heart. And you can never claim that something in your heart for which your action is the opposite. 
So if you say, I love Allah, you better show it. If you say, I believe in Allah, you better show it in action. And that's not my philosophy. This is the Quran. The Quran says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Say, if you truly love Allah, follow me. So this is not a philosophy. This is not someone's idea. This is the Quran. So we have one of two choices, no third. Either we live up to our claim or not make a claim that we don't live up to. Or at least don't rely on it. You can make the claim, but don't rely on a claim that you are a professional engineer, so on and so forth, when you don't practice engineering. Don't cheat me. I want to build a house. Why should I hire you? If all what you have is a degree 30 years ago, you never practiced it. Do you still become an engineer? Even though you've been driving a cab for 30 years? No, you're not an engineer anymore. Until you recertify, you repractice, and establish expertise. So, a Muslim you have been by starting off with La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But if it is not coupled with living as a Muslim, then you are a Muslim by claim, but not by practice. And only practice will make the claim true. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا It's one condition. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ those who believed and practiced righteous deeds. So you see now the parable that Allah is showing us in the experience of the children of Israel when they keep rebelling against Allah and he finally would send his wrath, ghadab, and he would make them live in the diaspora, in destitute, and poverty, and need, and homelessness. Are Muslims driven out of their homes today? Are they turned into homeless people? Are they? Did Allah start to, 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 to do injustice? Hasha lillah. Allah, inna Allah la yadlimu nasa shay'a, no matter how small. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَظْلِمُ النَّاسَ شَيْئًا So these are not stories of the past about the people of the past or for the people of the past. These are stories that keep recurring when conditions come back to the same position. The purpose is to give us a chance to make a choice. Do you want to continue in the same direction, or do you want to change course? Do you want to make a U-turn as an individual, as a family, as a community, as a society, or do you like it the way it is? Everything at the end, Muslims claim, and I agree, will end up being for the best interest of the Muslims. But is it going to be us? Is it going to be 10 generations down the road? Is it going to be the generation we raise? Which generation? The generation that pulls the ummah down should never claim to be on the top level of paradise. Because they pull the whole ummah down. Whether it is despotism, nepotism, dictatorship, tyranny, uh, hatred, bizarre stuff, call it what you want, but when your generation pulls the ummah down, your generation definitely is not going to be on the top level of paradise. That is not going to happen. Because the generation that pulls our ummah down and exposes even the next generation to same conditions and even worse is bringing havoc 
upon its own members. Those are not the ones who do righteous deeds to support their claim of their faith. I am not apologizing for stating the truth, which is harsh. It is also heavy on my heart. But better being heavy and truth than soft and falsehood. We have to face it up. We have to face our reality. There is no Muslim ummah in Iraq left to remake Iraq what it once was. I didn't believe what was happening in the 90s. But when I heard Secretary, what's her name, Albright, saying on uh, PBS News Hour, McNeil Leher News Hour, she said, we achieved five, five very important things in Iraq. I will try to remember all of them. Number one, number one, there is not a dictator in the region who will ever be willing to challenge the United States after that. It's finished. No challenges. They are all going to come running to us like boys. Number two, we secured the oil at the amounts we need, at the time we need, at the price we need. Number three, Iraq will never be a challenge or a threat to Israel, at least for the next 500 years. These are her words. These are her words. The fourth, we have established a permanent bases in the region, and we've tested the rapid deployment forces, how much it takes to uh, deploy them, and how many forces we need in the region. And I forgot number five. When she spoke like this, I didn't believe, because uh, Robert McNeil was asking her, what did we achieve after five years of destroying Iraq and all of this? And she said, these points. That's what we achieved. Security for Israel, securing oil for America, securing that the region will run our way, not anybody's way, and all of the rest of it. So now when we talk about Iraq, it's not what we have today. What we have today is not Iraq. Do we have Syria today? We don't have Syria today. Will we be sure to have Egypt a few years down the line? I'm not sure we do. I am sure more of the opposite than I am of the reality. Why? Because we as an ummah have run our ummah affairs amok. So much so that admittedly we should never expect any better unless we do any better. Unless we change course. And that, again, is not my word or my threat or my promise. This is the Quran. Allah says, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi'anfusihim. Allah would never change the condition of a people unless they change what is in themselves. You change your priorities then things may change. You change what you love, and then that will change. You change your values, the way you value things and people and activities and schedules and everything. If you don't train your life in your hand, you cannot claim that you want change. If you do not train in your bad habits, and bad manners, and bad behavior, and bad choices of friends, of work, or of anything, don't claim that we are willing to change. You see how long the path is, and that's why the slippery slope we've gone into for the past 20 years is not showing an end. We are not 
up to the end of the tunnel yet. Let alone out of the tunnel. We will never get out of that tunnel unless we wake up to our spiritual responsibilities. To let our faith guide our life, not our life twist the arm of Allah or his ayat or his ahadith to fit our wants and our expectations. We have to fit our wants and our expectations to Allah's expectations. We are the servants and he is the master. We have to accept it. And we have to be happy when we accept it. Don't take this as a sour pill that you have to swallow. It is the sweetest remedy for the worst disease. <laughs> what is more sweet than getting closer to Allah? What is more secure than living under the care and the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What gives you more happiness than connecting and keeping reconnecting with Allah every day? Nothing. Why do we think that our faith is a heavy chore? Why do we treat our faith as a heavy chore? You know what a chore is? Something that you must do whether you like it or not. It is not. It is the sweetest pill that treats the worst of diseases. It treats our arrogance. It treats our self-deceit that we give ourselves very lavish promises in the hereafter and even in this life and not wanting to work for it. It's not only that we are not working, we are not wanting to work. So the will has to be there. So the first step is to differ from the children of Israel. They didn't appreciate what they had until they tried what they wanted. And this is the lesson. They didn't like honey and quails. And when they tried the onion and the garlic and the lentil and the fava beans and all of what Egypt has to offer, with it is the humiliation, the exploitation, and the manipulation of the Pharaonic regime, which continues until today. It never changed. It never changed. So, as we are trying our worst nightmares, shouldn't we wake up when we are called to wake up? I think we should. And I think we should be happy to be called to wake up. So the first step is to not think like them. Don't live your wishful thinking dreams and make them reality as a substitute to our real reality. Our real reality is miserable. We have to face it. And to face it, we have to believe and we have to think differently so that we can behave differently. Our life is at stake. Our security is at stake. The life and security of the next generations, in plural, are at stake. And it is in our hand to change the course of our ship by starting at one point saying we need to live a different type of life. We need to live, think, and behave as Muslims. That's a simple decision. And it is going to get a lot of help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On our own, we can do nothing. But with his help, which we seek every day. Don't seek Allah's help without putting any effort. You have to wake up. You have to make wudu. You have to make prayer. You have to make good on your promises. Okay. That is because of their disobedience and transgression. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the exit out of those miseries. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَى وَالصَّابِئِينَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ 
ولا خوف عليهم is giving you security ولا هم يحزنون this ayah amazed me for a long time and it comes in two places here and in surah al-hajj it talks about inna alladhina amanu those who have believed and then it follows and those who kept returning i explained before that the word hadu and yahud is rooted in the concept of returning either returning back to allah when they are distressed or returning back to disobedience when they have it good right they did it both ways and the christians and the sabians those who left whatever religion to join another religion all of this is put in one package and it's an amazing package because throughout the quran the the believers have always been separated from the people of the book but here they are with the people of the book and with the sabians and the sabians also is used for uh, ignorant arabs who have left the religion of ibrahim and invented their own and those are the ones who told about prophet muhammad saba a muhammad saba means he lived the religion of his parents he changed the religion of his fathers so what does allah promise all of these people combined he who believed in allah and the latter day and did righteous deeds they will have the reward with allah there shall be no fear upon them nor shall they grieve he is promising any one of those he among them who believed in allah and the latter day and did righteous deeds without righteous deeds the faith is no more than a claim this is what the ayah is saying because in the beginning it says those who believed it didn't say الصالحات, which means i am calling those who claim to believe those who claim to be jews those who claim to be following jesus those who have lived any religion to any other religion that anyone who actually believes in allah and the day of judgment and does righteous deeds they shall have no fear upon them nor shall they grieve may allah give our ummah the security after fear and the faith that leads to righteous deeds allahumma amin الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله Brothers and sisters When you look at this ayah coming after the previous ayah you know what the exit of our miseries is the exit is right here ayah 62 surah al-baqarah keep reading it and choose your position choose your position to couple your faith and support it with righteous deeds in the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says laysa al-iman bit-tahalli wala bit-tamanni faith is not a decoration that you carry around nor is it up to your wishful thinking same like the quran says right ولكن الايمان ما وقر في القلب وصدقه العمل faith is what settles in the heart of belief in allah and is confirmed by actions short of that it is not faith if we understand the hadith correctly it is not faith to claim to believe and to live a life in which your behavior is contrary to whatever claim you make about your faith. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our heart 
to believe correctly and to guide our actions to be consistent with our faith. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم قنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم قنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم لا تخزنا يوم العرض عليك وعاملنا بالإحسان إذ الفضل منك وإليك تباركت ربنا وتعاليت اللهم يا واصل المنقطعين أوصلنا إليك اللهم خذ بأيدينا إليك أخذ الكرام عليك اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا ضعيفا إلا قويته اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان واجعلنا من الراشدين فضلا منك ونعمة اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة